Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, thanks for, for coming back and joining us for our main session here where we get to listen to our speaker today. This is, again, Silicon Valley M&A Affinity Group meeting, June 2022. And today we have Russell Hancock, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Joint Venture Silicon Valley. Uh, he's been in that position since 2003. Uh, and he's been described as a civic leader, a community gatherer, an institution building builder, a civic entrepreneur, social scientist, and advocate for regionalism. He's grown that organization tenfold since he started, uh, and he has a very powerful boards, mayors, CEOs, university presidents. Uh, the, uh, Russell also founded the annual State of the Valley Conference. It's a town hall meeting that gets 1,500 leaders together for a day in dialogue and discussion about the Valley. Um, Russell uh, was educated at Harvard in the field of government. He has a PhD in political science from Stanford University. He also continues to teach at, at Stanford, in fact. And finally, uh, Russell's been named by the Silicon Valley Business Journal as it's, in fact, he's regularly named to its annual list of Silicon Valley's most influential players. Uh, and he's in, interviewed in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Business Week, Financial Times, and Forbes. And you might see him as a frequent guest on NBC Nightly News. And finally, Russell lives in Palo Alto. And he is also, on top of all of that, he is also a, a concert pianist. And he appears as a soloist with symphony orchestras across the nation. So with that, I want to thank you for being here, Russell, uh, to talk to us about what all the good things you're doing at Joint Venture Silicon Valley. Thank you, Roger. That was a really lovely and gracious introduction, and uh, and I truly appreciate it. I lead an, an interesting organization. We are a think tank in all of the classical ways that you would think of a think tank. We do research, we provide analysis, we track data, we provide those data sets and various indexes that we publish. So that's uh, that's one thing that we do. But the organization is also different from a think tank because we're also a do tank. In other words, we will take the analysis coming out of the institute side of our house and we will tackle Silicon Valley problems, whatever whatever they may be. And we do it using the analysis of our institute and we gather the leaders of Silicon Valley to tackle all of those problems. So that's uh, that's who I am, that's what the organization does. And if you want to know more about it, I'll throw up the website, it's jointventure.org. And we would love for every one of your companies to be involved in joining us. But today it's my uh, assignment, if I understand it correctly, to update you on the state of the region. So I am going to take you through some material and uh, give you a sense of, uh, of where we are right now as a region, our, our major trends and some of the challenges that we face. So let me, uh, oh, I can't share my screen. It says the host is disabled screen sharing. So I wonder if somebody can make that happen. Adam, perhaps, or uh, somebody. Give me a moment here. I actually made you the co-host. Let me try again. Yeah, okay. Not Thank a you. Just let me know. And I can do this without slides too, it's not a problem. Oh no, with slides a lot better. Here you go, try this again. Uh, good, I am now going to share my screen. And there we go. Let's see if I can do this. So there you have it. That's us looking at Silicon Valley from space, actually looking at the greater Bay Area from space. And I just want to start by reminding everybody that actually what you're looking at here is one of the most extraordinary places on the planet. It's, um, it is the most prodigious regional economy in the history of regional economies. That is an objective statement. That's not me being grandiose or braggadocious. I'm just telling you those are the facts. There's no other place on the planet in our history uh, that has uh, experienced so much um, um, uh, continuous growth and expansion, so much innovation, so much inter, uh, entrepreneurship, so much com company formation. The impact of those companies on the world has been transformative. And what's most striking is that it keeps happening. It's happened over a 75, 80 year period. It's happened through successive waves of innovation and uh, it has required the Valley uh, and its industry clusters to invent themselves, then 
reinvent themselves and to do this multiple times over the generations. So we should never lose sight of that. It's an extraordinary place. Now, when the pandemic set in, people thought that we would be in some uh, jeopardy. Uh, I was among them. I thought that this was going to be serious, that maybe this would be the thing that would finally uh, 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 take Silicon Valley out of its game. Uh, it turned out not to be the case, and I'm going to explain that with a couple of charts here in, uh, in just a few seconds. It, but actually what happened, uh, I probably don't have to explain this to you, is that the pandemic turned out to be a bonanza for Silicon Valley and especially for its driving industries. And I'm talking about the tech sector because uh, our Silicon Valley companies were providing precisely what was required for a world that went into a sheltering environment. Uh, I, I mean, just to be obvious, we're sitting here talking on Zoom right now and Zoom is a Silicon Valley company, uh, but also the platforms for goods delivery, for meal delivery, for the delivery of entertainment while we are sheltering, uh, the uh, devices, the technologies, the chips, the, uh, um, uh, the architecture, all of those things came out of Silicon Valley and the world badly needed it. And as a result, it turns out that the pandemic was great for our economy. I'm going to dramatize this for you by showing you here's Silicon Valley um, going all the way back to the turn of the century. And you can see right after the epic recession in 2009, 2010, we took a small dip, but then uh, we were the first economy to emerge out of that recession. And as you can see, we had sustained growth each year, more impressive than the last. And um, that would have continued. I want to be clear about that. When the pandemic set in, we chose to, uh, 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 put into place an artificial intervention. In other words, we chose to shutter certain parts of our economy. And uh, as a result, they shut down completely. And then you can see right there in uh, 2020, we had, uh, uh, we had a job dip. But by 2021, in the middle of the pandemic, we're growing again. And now, uh, let me show you what happens here. Uh, by the end of uh, 2021, in other words, six months ago, we were already job positive. In other words, we were growing uh, and exceeding where we had been prior to the pandemic. Now, those jobs were um, uh, in, in the tech sector. And we'll talk about that in a moment. This is your unemployment chart. Uh, we're currently at about 2.1% unemployment. That, that's an update even from this chart. Economists will tell you that anything below 3% is considered uh, full employment. And so that's what happened here. We spiked up. Those are the artificial interventions. We figured out uh, for the most part, how to recover uh, most of those jobs by introducing new pro protocols, working remotely, distancing, all of the rest. And so here we are back at practically full uh, unemployment, uh, full employment two years later. Look what happened to our tech, uh, our tech sector. This is uh, market cap. And uh, it, it had that immediate drop when the pandemic set in, that's to be expected. But then we came roaring back uh, through the depths of the pandemic. You can see our tech sector um, just uh, recapturing and then exceeding the market cap. It reached $14 trillion uh, before the stock market started tumbling uh, just a, a few weeks ago. And I don't actually have charts that show uh, the result of uh, the last uh, sort of valuations. Uh, but but uh, uh, the point I'm making here is that we hit, uh, we exceeded 14 trillion in market cap, and that's more uh, than we had ever seen in our entire history. That, uh, that during a pandemic is extraordinary. Here's what happened in the venture capital uh, uh, industry. We never thought we'd see anything like this, certainly not in a pandemic. That number you see, that last bar on the right, is $95 billion in venture capital. That's, that's uh, funds that were generated here and invested here in Silicon Valley. That's just amazing. I, I want to point out that this chart is inflation adjusted and that total 95 billion exceeds everything we have ever seen. In fact, in most cases, cases it doubles everything that we've ever seen. And it, uh, it is practically double what we saw during the dot-com craziness back at the turn of the century. So that's just absolutely remarkable. Uh, correspondingly, we see uh, tremendous amounts of startup activity. And this is a chart going back to 1992. And you can see that uh, the startup activity there is record breaking. And we didn't expect that uh, during the height of a pandemic. And yet there it is. It, you may find it interesting that uh, 
we're reporting here both San Francisco and Silicon Valley. In other words, the south part of the Bay, the entire peninsula, San Francisco. It's interesting that San Francisco has become a real location for startup activity. Uh, in fact, it's starting to uh, outnumber Silicon Valley proper in terms of the startup activity that's happening. And you probably feel that, you probably understand that instinctively. That's what's going on. Angel Investment also had a banner year as we rolled uh, as we rolled through the pandemic this is a chart that shows you uh, unicorns and decacorns i'm telling people that the term unicorn is uh, no longer apt uh, you know this i know i don't have to explain this to you but a unicorn is a privately held company that is valued at more than a billion dollars billion with a b and the reason they named them unicorns is because they are considered uh, practically mythical because they are so rare and unusual, but that's no longer the case. In, in Silicon Valley, we have herds of unicorns. In the Bay Area, also the case, uh, more than any other uh, part of the world. It's, uh, it's really quite extraordinary, and that continued uh, throughout, uh, throughout the pandemic. Throughout the pan pandemic, we also continued to see uh, the completion of development. I didn't expect that. We saw construction uh, grind to a halt in those early months of the pandemic, but then they figured it out. Uh, new protocols, new disinfecting uh, procedures, distancing procedures, uh, the masking and all of that, and the, and the construction resumed. More significantly, the major drivers of that construction, which would be our tech companies, especially the largest ones, uh, they did not... Um, uh, they didn't call off any of their leasing activity or any of their expansion plans. We thought they would. Uh, the nature of work has changed. We're seeing that these uh, look like permanent changes. People are seeing working from home to be not just a perk, but actually a right. And in light of those developments, we thought that this would probably spell a new dynamic for commercial uh, construction. But as of the end of the year, uh, we, we haven't observed that. The, uh, all of those projects are proceeding. And uh, we're actually approving in, in the pipeline, we're approving more construction than we ever have in uh, previous years. So it's all pretty amazing. So there, there you have it. That's uh, me talking out of one side of my mouth, telling you that Silicon Valley, the pandemic notwithstanding, is still an amazing place. It's still a prodigious place. Uh, those are all true statements. Uh, I should also tell you that in just the last few weeks, there have been in, you know, significant developments. Uh, we're seeing some revaluations on the, on, the, on, on the stock markets. We're seeing some of the major tech firms uh, have, their, have their, uh, their stock prices uh, um, uh, come tumbling down. Uh, we, we see that as signs of not a, not a collapse, but maybe just some necessary adjustments. And um, uh, there, those, those adjustments will be taking place over the coming year. And uh, the evidence of it is that there are some layoffs in some of our key technology firms. And I can't quantify uh, any of that for you yet. Uh, and so that's something that we'll just have to wait and see how this next, uh, how this next chapter plays out. However, now I'm going to talk out of the other side of my mouth because I told you that uh, we have this prodigious economy. You should also understand that um, there was real pain and suffering that was experienced uh, during the pandemic in our economy by our neighbors and our brothers and sisters and our friends and our colleagues and our, and, and our workmates. Uh, this is a chart that shows you that um, the tech sector, that thriving, burgeoning tech sector, uh, is accounting for about 30% of our economy. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's growing. It used to be about a quarter of our economy. Now it's approaching about a third of our economy. However, the blue slice of the pie, the big chunk that takes up about half of the pie, those are the other kinds of jobs. These are what we call jobs of place. These are retail jobs, uh, manufacturing, uh, construction, healthcare, education, the kinds of jobs, in other words, that you would find in any other economy in any other part of the country. And that part of our pie is shrinking as a result of the pandemic, and it's not yet recovering. In fact, you should understand that even though I told you that there's um, uh, two 2% uh, 2 unemployment. That is not the case when we go sector by sector. And these sectors uh, are still experiencing 10, 20% uh, percent unemployment. They're not recovering. We thought that as we emerged out of the pandemic, it would be like throwing that switch back on and people would just take their places and we would continue firing on all of our cylinders. We have now learned that that's actually not the case. What we're learning is that uh, there was a lot of displacement during the pandemic, and a lot of our uh, people that were working in the service sector 
uh, have left the Bay Area. And I'll say more about that at the end. Uh, we've also learned that the people who have remained have emerged with uh, a new set of values, a new set of a new way of seeing the world, newfound bargaining power, and um, and so there's an adjustment. There's an adjustment in all of these sectors, arts, entertainment, transportation, accommodation, retail, uh, nonprofits, my industry. Uh, there's adjustment going on here. And employers will tell you that hiring is very difficult, even though uh, there are openings. Uh, they're not being filled by that set of people that we would have thought would immediately fill them. And so there's a period of adjustment here that uh, is going to take us longer than we thought. Okay, now I'd like to just chat about um, our income picture. Um, because I think this is very striking and we should all have a healthy sense of this if we're thinking about our region. This is, uh, this is uh, just an extraordinary chart. This shows you Silicon Valley and San Francisco in terms of our average annual earnings and how we stack up um, when we compare ourselves to the rest of the country. So you will see that uh, the average annual earnings in Silicon Valley are about $170,000. And by that, I mean it, all forms of comp compensation divided by the number of people in the workforce, $170,000. The national figure is $70,000. That's extraordinary. We're more than double the national average. Now we have higher costs in this region, but our costs aren't double the cost of other places. And so this shows you that Silicon Valley, the Bay Area continue to be a place where people can, uh, uh, there really is something to this notion that people can pursue a path to prosperity here. Um, here's median household income. Uh, we like to show different forms of measuring income because our averages, like this chart, those averages are always gonna be skewed because we have so many extremely high earners in the region. So here's median, it shows you median, but even when you use median household, you can still see that we're uh, fully double uh, the national average. In other words, it's extraordinary. I'll keep making that point. But here I want to show you how that wealth is distributed. This chart is showing you that, um, in Silicon Valley, we have about 50 billionaires. We have about 300,000 millionaires, and that's in terms of their liquid assets, and that we have some pretty amazing income divides. The chart is showing you actually that um, the top 1% of earners, uh, actually, let me show you this. I want, to, I want to show it to you in plain English. In Silicon Valley, this is what the chart is showing you. Households in the top quarter, the top 25% of earners are actually holding 92% of the wealth, 92% of the wealth. Uh, households in the bottom half are holding uh, less than 2% of the wealth. In other words, uh, Silicon Valley has uh, the nation's most stark and yawning uh, income divides and wealth divides. This is the Gini coefficient. Uh, you, you probably remember that the Gini coefficient is a form of measuring income uh, equality. Uh, and what it means is that a, a genie of 100 would mean that one person holds all of the wealth. And a genie of zero would mean that all of the people are holding all of the wealth equally. So I thought you'd be fascinated to see this. Uh, through much of Silicon Valley's history, we were a middle class town, just a regular place with uh, regular folks, um, you know, working at Lockheed, living in um, uh, living in tract houses in Sunnyvale and mowing their own lawns. Now, somewhere around the turn of the century, that story started to change on us dramatically. And what we see now is uh, a gain in the, in the Gini coefficient of more than 30 points over the past 15 years. We used to be right there in the middle. We are now uh, approaching 70, 70 on the Gini coefficient. Now, Economists who study international development and uh, the emergence of, of developing countries, they will tell you that a Gini coefficient, anything over 60 is considered politically unstable. So that's uh, something that we also have to be reckoning with in Silicon Valley. Many people are surprised to see this. Uh, they're surprised to learn that fully one third of households in Silicon Valley are not self-sufficient. That means that they left to their own devices cannot make ends meet 
And in order to make ends meet, they're receiving some form of assistance. And that means it's coming from a friend, a, a extended family from a, a church or faith community or from a government program. One third of the houses in the households in Silicon Valley, not self-sufficient. This number is extraordinary. I wanted to call it out. We've learned that in Silicon Valley, 44% uh, of children, of all the children living in Silicon Valley, are living in homes that are not self-sufficient. And all of this is happening at the very same time that inflation is set in and it couldn't be uh, more inopportune. Uh, people are getting absolutely hammered by inflation, especially over uh, energy uh, prices, including at the gas pump, but also including basic things like food, like, uh, like uh, child care. So it's tough. It's tough out there. So uh, now I've told you two different stories. One story I told you is uh, that we're a prodigious economy and that we are a wealth making machine. That is all true. It's completely true. But now I've told you about the other side of, uh, of Silicon Valley's story, which is that it's a very difficult place, a punishing place. Uh, it's a place where not all of us are thriving. In fact, fully a third of us are not not even uh, not even uh, getting by. And so Silicon Valley is both things. And we need to understand that we are a complex and multifaceted place. Now, um, I should watch the clock because uh, I promised to leave plenty of time for questions. So let me just blow through this next thing. I was going to tell you about housing, but I think you already understand this. Uh, so I don't need to uh, I don't need to detail all of this for you. We have the nation's highest housing prices. Uh, let me just leave it at that. Uh, that didn't used to be the case. It is now. Uh, the median sale price of a, of a house in Silicon Valley is uh, $1.3 million. Um, and uh, here's the percentage of first time home buyers that can afford that median priced home. And that percentage is, uh, is, um, is uh, decreasing. I'll just skip over to this. Here's your problem. Uh, the reason housing is so expensive, it's, 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 it's very simple. It's supply and demand. And the green bars on this chart are showing you the number of jobs that we've created uh, each successive year. The yellow bars are showing you how many housing units we have approved in those same years. And so you can see the mismatch. There's the mismatch. It's about seven to one. Uh, over the past seven years, um, we're not going up to the pandemic. So just prior to the pandemic, we added about 800,000 jobs in our region. That's the equivalent of taking a city the size of San Francisco and dropping that onto our landscape. But during that same period of time, we only uh, approved 170,000 new units. So it's about seven to one. That's the mismatch, and so no, uh, no surprise. Uh, we um, uh, we just have the highest uh, housing prices anywhere in in the country. Now I've talked some about how uh, this is a difficult uh, place for Silicon Valley. If you're not happening to happen to be in one of our tech sectors or you know one of our one of our high flyers. Um, so in our work, we've also been trying to bring this equity lens and look at uh, those things uh, from uh, from a racial, a race and ethnicity standpoint as well. Um, I'm going to blow through this really quickly uh, so that we have time for questions. Uh, here's the point. Uh, we're a very diverse region and we and we celebrate that. We absolutely celebrate that. Uh, we're not a majority region. We used to be a majority white uh, population. That hasn't been the case for several years. And now there is no majority. We're 39% Asian, we're 29% white, we're 24% Hispanic, and then, uh, and then all of the rest. But here's what's interesting. Even though we're the nation's most diverse region, uh, we are choosing not to live in uh, diverse uh, neighborhoods. This is a, a chart showing you what's uh, what the Bay Area looked like in 1980. And uh, if it's green, that means that uh, those neighborhoods are diverse. And if it's red, that means that they're not. So here we are in 1990, uh, and you can see the red increasing. Look at that, 2000, we're mostly red. That means that when you uh, look at your neighbor, that means the uh, it's a very high percentage that your neighbor doesn't look like you do. Um, or now, if, if you're in red, it's a very high percentage that your neighbor looks exactly like you. That's what I'm trying to say. And now look at us here in 2010, mostly red. So that's interesting. Even though we're a diverse region, we haven't sorted ourselves. We have sorted ourselves into uh, homogenous uh, neighborhoods. Now, um, uh, we also know that there are persistent disparities by race, the dropout rates, the educational attainment levels, uh, those 
uh, uh, those tracked by race. And so it's, uh, it's very sad to know that about our region. Nevertheless, those are the facts and I'm here to present those facts. But this astonished us, even though there are these persistent and profound racial disparities, uh, they also obtain, even if the, um, if, if the people are of similar educational levels of attainment. So I'm going to call that out for you here and we'll put it in plain English. Uh, in Silicon Valley, it's true that Hispanic and Latino residents make an average wage that's 64% less than similarly educated white residents. In other words, they have the same level of education. Uh, in the case of our black or African-American residents, it's 50%. Um, I showed you this chart already, 33% uh, are not self-sufficient. Uh, I just want you to understand that that also tracks by race and ethnicity of the householder, and so this this shows you that, and uh, uh, you know these are these are sad things. But in my remaining time, oh, I, I also wanted to point this out. The hope has always been that tech, uh, our burgeoning tech sector, can be a pathway to address these disparities and that there will be opportunities there and pipelines. And for a fact, our tech companies are working on this. There are um, the leadership of those tech companies have expressed themselves committed to doing something about these disparities. And uh, uh, I believe that they are absolutely sincere. However, it's not there yet. It's not happening yet. And that's what this chart shows you. As of, um, as of December 31st, 2021, this is what it looks like in the leadership ranks of our largest uh, tech companies. 61% of the leaders are, are um, white, 25% are Asian. So about 86% of the leadership roles are held by whites or Asians. Hispanics uh, only in 5% of those roles. For our African-American um, members, it's merely 3%. That's what it looks like, even though, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, our Hispanics account for about a quarter of the population, and um, uh, those proportions don't obtain in uh, in the tech sector. So we have work to do. This is the saddest chart of all. It shows you that the people that are working on the front lines during the pandemic were also um, sorted by race. In other words, the, the people that were holding those front lines jobs and, and therefore had the most exposure to the disease prior to the vaccine, uh, tended to be our Hispanic or um, um, African American uh, members, and their uh, their death rate uh, was twice and three times that of white counterparts during the during the disease uh, during the pandemic. So these are pretty stark things. Uh, I want to conclude by uh, asking this question, and then uh, we can talk about it in the in the comment period. Uh, the question is, are we experiencing an exodus? Uh, I want to tell you that the answer to that question is uh, hard to come up with. We're not sure yet. We're, we're just not sure. We don't know the answer to that. Um, we don't know the answer to that question. It is true that a lot of people during the pandemic chose to leave and work remotely. That technically is not an exodus. Uh, technically, that job is still in Silicon Valley. It still counts uh, on our payrolls. It still counts on our tax rolls. And so we, we're, not, we're not choosing to call that an exodus. We're calling it an exodus when people choose to leave the region when when human capital and other forms of capital leave the region. Uh, and, and the question is, are we, uh, are we experiencing that? And uh, so far, we're not. We're, we are experiencing pop, uh, population decline, but that's fed by lower birth rates and uh, by higher death rates uh, because we do have an aging population now. And then it's also uh, attributed to the policies of the previous administration in the White House, which, uh, 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 just factually speaking, uh, made uh, our country less hospitable, far less hospitable to people who would be immigrating here and did that in a number of ways, including the quotas themselves. And so for those three reasons, at least we've had, uh, uh, we, we have declining uh, population growth. Um, and then there is out migration. People are choosing to move out of the, out of the region. And the number, the, the absolute number was 40,000. That's what this chart is showing you. 40,000 left the region. But remember, our workforce is 1.7 million uh, in Silicon Valley. And so 40,000 really is uh, a small, uh, 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 maybe even an insignificant percentage of that, of, of that total number. So we have to put it in that perspective. Uh, although there may be uh, increasing trends and they may be, uh, they may be um, 
um, they may be speeding up. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if in coming years we see more out migration. One reason is because we've learned that you can do the sorts of things you do in Silicon Valley working remotely. And so that, uh, that might become a major trend. Um, I think a more important question, oh, by the way, of those 40,000 that are leaving, there is a notion that they're going to Austin. That's what people think. Uh, and then there's a the notion people are saying they're going to Miami and that they're going to Denver, to those places. What we actually found is that they're not leaving the Bay Area. They're moving to the perimeter of the Bay Area. That was an interesting finding for us. Uh, and why the perimeter? Because that's where the housing is more affordable. And then if they leave the Bay Area, we find that they're going to Sacramento. And then finally, uh, we've learned that they're going to Seattle, to Phoenix, and then uh, finally to Austin and places like that. So those are interesting findings so far. I think this is a more important question. Are we losing companies? Um, if we stop uh, repeating our pattern of reinvention and co company formation and entrepreneurship and the innovation that happens here, then that really does spell a new chapter in our unfolding history. So this is an important question. Here's the answer to the question. So far, we've lost four companies. And let me tell you who those companies are. Um, it's these four, Oracle, HP, Palantir, and Tesla. And frankly, in my view, the reason we lost those companies is because their CEOs had particular reasons. There were, there were stories that were particular to each company, and they weren't necessarily leaving and dusting their feet and saying good riddance to the Bay Area. They just had, they had things that, uh, they had reasons that compelled them to leave. And yes, they relocated the headquarters, but what's also significant is that they left their workforce behind. In fact, HP and uh, Oracle and Tesla uh, actually increased their square footage in the Bay Area. Uh, Tesla, um, took out more square footage where its headquarters is located in Palo Alto, and they're still investing in the plant in, uh, in Fremont. So we have to put it in that uh, perspective as well. This is my last chart. This chart shows you three things in one chart. It's a busy chart, but the size of the bubble tells you how many, it tells you the total number of tech jobs. The um, location on the x-axis tells you the uh, growth rate, uh, uh, how, much, how much you're growing in terms of tech talent. And then the, um, the, the y-axis is telling you the share of the workforce that, is, that um, tech is claiming. And so where you want to be on this chart is, uh, is up and to the right, and there we are. Uh, there's, there's no place even, a, even a, approaching us. Um, with possible exception of Seattle, but they're still in our wake. And so this, I think, is how we have to think about this as we talk about the exodus. And with that, I think I will just throw up this uh, website. This is our website, jointventure.org. You can go there. You can sign up for our materials. We would love to send you all of these uh, things um, and invitations to our events. Uh, and so you can just go there and you can sign up and we would love to have you as, a, as part of the joint venture family. And with that, Roger, let me uh, stop sharing my screen and I'll go over to you. Oops. Well, thank you very much, Russell. That was really, really interesting. I want to thank you for being here. Russell Hancock, Joint Venture Silicon Valley.